Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. This Steve Jones Show podcast is now loading. The Steve Jones Show podcast is presented by Sunbury Motor Company, Purdy Insurance, Brewers Outlet, and NIL Game Changers. Bringing you an in-depth look at Penn State sports and more. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The Steve Jones Show is presented by Brewers Outlet, Sunbury Motor Company, and Purdy Insurance. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. All right, great to have you with us on this uh, Thursday. Bye week for Penn State. We'll get into that in just a moment. Today's show being brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, Routes 11 and 15, Elmo's Wharf online, sunburymotors.com, Ford, Kia, Hyundai, the best in new inventory, great pre-owned inventory with the Sunbury Motors guarantee, terrific service department that backs it up every step of the way, whether it's an inspection or it happens to be routine or difficult, they handle it all at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors, Kia, Routes 11 and 15, almost Wharf and online at sunburymotors.com. Always a pleasure to be joined by old friend, good friend, Adam Rittenberg. Adam, first of all, how have you been? Doing great, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right. Yep. Uh, it was a big weekend for the Big Ten last weekend. I think when they put all the expansion together, Saturday was a day that they were hoping to get where you've got Penn State, USC in the afternoon and Oregon, Ohio State at night. In watching the Penn State game, what in the end struck you about the performance by both teams? Well, yeah, I think both teams had their moments. And you know, for Penn State uh, to, to win the way they did, um, you showed a lot of resiliency. You showed some character to go out on the road, long trip. Obviously, uh, you're playing against a team that you know is it has talent on both sides of the ball. And you know, I was talking about this earlier on another show. Like, I, I kind of like USC's team better than I have the last couple of years, maybe because it's a little bit more balanced. They just haven't had the results. And you know, Penn State made a couple more plays there down the stretch. Obviously, Tyler Warren had an incredible performance at, at tight end, and you know, continues to sort of lift up that passing game. And, um, you know, a defense that was uh, struggling a little bit early, uh, you know, made, made, made some key plays there to, to, to secure a pretty important win. And, you know, now, uh, now Penn State enters, uh, you know, a stretch that, that will really define their season most likely. But they, they do so with an undefeated record. Uh, in fact, I, what I've been telling people about USC when they ask me about them is that they've lost three games by a total of 13 points. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's not a bad team when you when you're that close and not getting the result as you talk about. Drew Aller's now a second year starter at quarterback. Are you seeing a different type of quarterback in Drew Aller now because he is a second year starter? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's a second year starter, but he's also in year one with Andy Kotelnicki's system, so it, it's still new, it's still fresh. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's been impressive, I think, for the most part. Um, I think people need to realize that, you know, yes, he is a more experienced quarterback, but he's still, you know, in a new system, in some big games, you know, going through some of those natural ups and downs uh, that, 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 you, that you go through when, when you're in a new, a new system. So I, I, I think I've seen a, a more confident Drew Aller. Um, obviously, they've been able to to make some more big plays. There's some creativity in the scheme. I mean, they're, they're still not elite at wide receiver, and they're still uh, being able to generate uh, some more chunk plays in the pass game. So encouraging, but with the caveat, you know, they got he's got to get it done against Ohio State. I mean, looked terrible against Ohio State last year. Didn't look well against Michigan uh, either. Like those are the games that he's going to be judged by. But so far, so good. Uh, and uh, now Oregon, Ohio State. Um, I had a chance to watch the last two and a half quarters on the plane coming back. Um, Oregon's played well to this point, but haven't been, quote, overwhelming because I saw them play Oregon State a little bit of against Boise State. What did Saturday night's performance at Autzen tell you about Oregon? 
Well, I, I think it showed a, a couple of things, you know, that they are really talented to begin with and, you know, that they can find a way to win uh, a marquee game like that. I mean, Dan Lanning's done a lot of great things, but had fallen short, you know, three times against their rival Washington, um, hadn't won a Pac-12 title, um, you know, just, just hadn't won the biggest of games. And I think it showed that Dylan Gabriel – uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't have thought of him up until that game as, you know, a solid, experienced quarterback, you know, certainly not Bo Nix and, and maybe not a, a, a national championship caliber player. And then you saw what he was able to do in that game, you know, getting Evan Stewart involved, you know, going after Denzel Burke, who's going to be an NFL cornerback, and, and really making him look bad. Um, I think that, that, that was encouraging. And, you know, I think the line of scrimmage play for Oregon – you know, everyone kind of still associates them with speed and flash and the changing uniforms, what have you. But you know, Dan Lanning's really built that program at the line of scrimmage with development, with their transfers. You know, Derek Harmon has been a major addition coming in from Michigan State to the defensive tackle spot, which really helped with a guy like Jordan Birch out. And then I think offensive line, they are much better than they looked early in the year. They had the new, some new players in the interior. They lost Jackson Powers Johnson, who was an outstanding center, the Remington Trophy winner. Uh, they, they figured out some pieces in the middle of their line, and, and they're just, they're just uh, right now looking like a, a pretty complete team. Um, to be able to beat Ohio State without Birch, you know, losing a, another player to the ejection, that, that's, that's encouraging. They, 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 they can certainly build off of that. And, in fact, it was one of those games where you look at the number of mistakes that Oregon actually made in the game. The margin actually could have been wider um, than it ended up being. So then let's flip the page. Now let's, let's look at Ohio State. We all know that they're talented in every level. What did they show you? What didn't they show you on Saturday night? Well, yeah, I think you can see the talent, um, you know, their ability to attack defenses through, you know, multiple running backs. They're not overly reliant on one receiver. They have two of the best, probably the top ten receivers in the sport right now in uh, Jeremiah Smith, the dazzling freshman, and then Emeka Ibuka, who people forget about, who would be the number one receiver on, you know, pretty much any team in the country. So they have a lot of different um, weapons for uh, Will Howard, um, you, you know, and then defensively, you know, they, they, they have individuals who, who can make plays. But I go back to that side of the ball, Stephen. This is somewhat thematic. If you look at Ohio State and why they haven't, you know, won the biggest games here the last few years is, you know, do they have everybody collectively on defense playing at a high level late in games? And, you know, you look at the fourth quarter of the Oregon loss, uh, the fourth quarter of the Michigan losses over the years, um, even the fourth quarter against Georgia in the national semifinal, you know, a game that Ohio State really thoroughly outplayed Georgia in for most of the most part and would have gone on and won the national championship, in my opinion. They, they, they don't make enough stops in the fourth quarter. So w- what is happening in those scenarios that's holding them back? And, you know, w- I just praised Oregon for their line of scrimmage play. I think it's fair to question a little bit where Ohio State's at with their offensive and defensive lines. Coaches have told me that the offensive line was an issue last year. Uh, you know, they just lost uh, Josh Simmons, one of their best linemen, uh, to probably a season-ending injury, which is unfortunate. And then the defensive line, you know, under Larry Johnson, who's someone your listeners know a lot about, we've heard about this group for many years. We've heard about they, how they're supposed to be the best defensive line in the country. I just don't see it on a consistent basis. Now, we'll see what happens uh, after this open week. They get Nebraska, then they come out to State College, you know, where, where J.T. Tuamalu had the best single-game performance I've ever seen live from a single defensive player but Thanks. since then what's he really done like Jack Sawyer has been okay better than okay at times but certainly doesn't look like the number one overall recruit uh at, you know on a consistent basis so I, I I'm pretty critical of their line of scrimmage play I think they could be better there yeah, thanks for reminding me about JTT two years ago. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable because, you know, people thought, I, know. And I, I wrote that, a whole I story know. about Indomitian Sue and what he did against Texas in the Big, Te- the Big 12 championship game. They talk about that being, you know, the best defensive performance in recent memory. I wasn't there for it. So I'm always going to reference JTT at Beaver Stadium. I, I never saw anything like that from a defensive player. Yeah, I agree. I, I didn't either along the way. I mean, I, you know, I saw LeVar Arrington do some things, too, that were pretty unbelievable. But that was – you felt like it was a one-man wrecking crew. With all due respect, and you and you know, I mean, I know – I have no idea if you've listened to anything anybody 
that we do. But Jack Ham and I always give whomever's playing well credit for playing well. Right? Doesn't matter what team they're on. If you make plays, we talk about hey, <laughs> that was a great, great performance. Uh, we are getting to the point of the season where the, the two loss pool is going to grow. Oh, and it's going to grow, no question, this weekend because, you know, let's face it, Alabama, Tennessee, one's going to have two losses. If Georgia doesn't win at te- Texas, they've got two losses. How important to you now becomes the two loss pool from this point forward? Yeah, it's really important. And, you know, a lot of people don't love the fact that we're talking about two loss teams and evaluating them for the playoff, but that's just the reality of where, you know, having a larger system is. Um, so, yeah, it is critical for, like, what do you do with Georgia? If Georgia goes out and loses a, a single-score game on the road to Texas, are they out of the playoff picture? No, they absolutely should still be in it, but their margin for error has, has shrunk. You know, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens to the loser of the Alabama-Tennessee game, especially if it's Tennessee, because you know, Tennessee looked like a world beater. I mean, they were outscoring everybody by 50 points in the first three weeks, and their offense – has completely flipped and, and looked very ordinary or, or, or worse than ordinary here the last three weeks. And so, you know, if they lose to Alabama, um, you know, what, what what's our view of, of, of Tennessee? And if Alabama loses, you know, they, they haven't exactly played well here since the, since the halftime of the Georgia game. What do we think of Alabama? Um, and, and, and there's so many other factors involved. And, you know, some of your other wins outside of conference are going to come into play. But, you know, I was at Baton Rouge last week, Steve, and, you know, saw, saw LSU – uh, and Ole Miss, and you know, I, I I said it going into the game that that this is a more important game for Ole Miss because they already have a loss in conference to right. a team that they're more talented than in Kentucky. And we don't say this often, but in watching those two teams on Saturday night, Ole Miss is more talented than LSU, and they lost again. So it's very mm-hmm. difficult for me to see, even though they have Georgia and some other games left, very difficult to see Ole Miss making the playoff. Whereas LSU, they're undefeated in SEC play. Uh, and they have Alabama and A&M and some other good opportunities, even Arkansas this week, they, they, they suddenly become a playoff contender. So it really is going to change week to week in terms of how we feel. But if you have two losses, you, you, you better win out or, or, or have a really good schedule and a lot of things break your way because otherwise you're not making the playoff. Yeah, uh, no question. Uh, and uh, the, the, there's also another element, too. That's the Dan Lanning, 12 guys on the field. As somebody who uh, um, broadcast the Brett Bielema three kickoffs because <laughs> that one year that the ball, when the ball was kicked, the clock started. Uh, so they deliberately went off sides three times. Uh, now we have this. What strikes me about it is you could have 12 guys in the field. What if Oregon intercepted the ball? What if they recovered a fumble? They could have ended the game there. And, of course, 12 men in the field. What do you think about how they closed the loophole? Well, yeah, I think the idea was that they knew they were going to get penalized. Um, right. and, uh, and and the idea was, hey, they, they, they can't hurt us for, for the clock part of it. And so, yeah, I mean, they could have given up a touchdown. They could have intercepted the ball. There's all sorts of things that happened. But I think they were okay with that, knowing that there would only be – in, in, the, in you know the reality, six seconds left in the game. So yeah, it, it's funny you bring that up, Steve. I, I talked to Brett about that play um, just a couple of days ago, and a lot of people don't remember it, but I know you and and and, and Penn State fans and, and all sorts of folks in your area are very very uh, much aware of what happened back in 2006. And uh, you know, again, coaches. I just talked to a, a Big Ten coach a few minutes ago who said, "Listen, you know, if it's within, if it's if it's in the rule book, and, and we're you know, it's it's not unethical. Like we're we are paid to win games, and we're going to find every possible way to do that." You know, even if it leaves some people uncomfortable or in, in the case of, of that play or, or the one that happened last week at Oregon, you'll prompt uh, an adjustment in terms of how it's officiated. So, yeah, these coaches are, are looking for all of those things. I think the amazing part is you practice those situations over and over and over, and you might only get them, you know, once in ten years or, or once every six or seven years, and you have to be ready to execute it in that moment. And for Oregon's sake, they, they did, and it certainly contributed to their win. Well, again, if it's within the scope of the rule, I mean, in other words, what Brett Bielema did was not against the rules. 
No. Right. Now, is it in the spirit of the game? No. But it's not against the rules either, <laughs> at least yeah. in that particular year. So that's why I'm, you know. So did um, did Dan Lanning do something that, in the spirit of the game, like really? But was it against the rules? No. Right. So he, uh, it's like pine tar on the bat. Billy Martin pointed yep. it out. <laughs> so hey, there you go. <laughs> that's my analogy. Right, yeah, and I think you're going to – it'll be interesting to see what else surfaces. I don't think this is going to happen, like, as a, a huge trend, and we're going to see one of these per week. But, you know, it, it, it just – you, you kind of wonder what, what's the next one that could come up that we're all talking about. Um, and maybe it isn't a big game like a Penn State, Ohio State, or, or uh, you know, Oregon, you know, uh, uh, Washington, or whatever it is later in the season. It'll be, it'll be, a, fun, it'll be a fun thing to discuss. Let me ask you about Texas. They're the number one team in the country. They went on the road. They beat Michigan. Then they played in the Cotton Bowl uh, in the Red River game and really manhandled Oklahoma. They did have a couple of holes coming into the season. So what has Steve Car- uh, Sarkeesian done to fill those holes, fill their gaps, and the fact Quinn Ewers has missed time and Arch Manning has stepped in? What's your thought on Texas? Yeah, no, I'm really impressed with with Texas. I mean, with the caveat that both Michigan and Oklahoma are are very limited offenses right now. Like those are not that's not the offense that they're going to face on Saturday with Georgia. But you know, in talking to Sark last week, you know, he he mentioned that you know people probably made too much of the fact of who we lost, say on the defensive line, and they lost two great players. I mean, Byron Murphy the second was a first round draft pick, and Javondre Sweat won the Outland Trophy, and probably would have been a first round pick if he didn't have the uh, the drunken driving incident, um, and he's making plays at the next level. And so you lose those two pieces, but they have you know two veteran tackles to step right in, and they have really good depth on the edges with some returning players and then players that they've added through the portal. So you know Texas has been very very effective, I think, um, in terms of supplementing their roster you know through the portal. You know at some positions more than others, like the receivers, most of them are transfers. You know, defensive end, they have, you know, Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke that are back, but they also, you know, picked up Trey Moore, who might have been the best pass rusher in the group of coming in from, from UTSA, and they've developed some younger players on that defensive line. I think that, that's the line of scrimmage at Texas. Everyone talks about Sark and quarterback play and, and creative play calling, and that's all true. But I think the work that he's done on the defensive line, but maybe more so the offensive line with Kyle Flood, your know, former Big Ten coach at Rutgers, who is, is one of the, the more respected line coaches in the country. You know, Texas's offensive line, you know, between the end of the Mac Brown era and Sark getting there, was largely ineffective. Not post, not producing guys in, in, into the draft. You know, somewhat similar to that stretch that Penn State had. Like, hey, why is it Penn State producing NFL offensive linemen? Why isn't Texas producing NFL offensive linemen? You know, those days are over now. And they have one of the better, better lines in, in college football, and you're going to see that play out in the draft next year. So I don't see a whole, a whole lot of weaknesses there, Steve. Although, again, reiterating, they haven't seen an offense like Georgia. They haven't seen an offense like Alabama and some of the other teams, A&M, even uh, later in the year. So I think we can have a little bit better judgment on their defense after they're, they're stressed a little bit more. But, man, having Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning as your quarterbacks uh, certainly gives Sark some, some great options. Uh, one final thing, and that is, it is on Arch Manning. We know what Quinn Ewers can do, and I'm, I'm impressed. Arch Manning has at least had his shot. Just an initial play – how good's he been? Yeah, I mean, I think Arch. You know, I think he, he he has played well and 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 shown that he's not exactly a, a you know in terms of play style exactly like his uncles and you know obviously has that athleticism component to go with uh, to to go with his his arm talent. Now, you know, I think the Mississippi State game showed that he's not quite there. Uh, Sark, you know, I think rightfully kind of snapped at a reporter just now today who asked him about you know, possible in-game quarterback change that, you know, he, he's very committed to Quinn Ewers and, and he should be. And Quinn's earned the right to be the starting quarterback for Texas this season. And Arch will be the starting quarterback for Texas next year. That's just how it's going to work. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's always, always going to be extra attention on him. And, you know, he, he, uh, he, he performed pretty well, you know, under, the, under those circumstances, albeit against weaker, weaker competition. So um excited to see his development, but I think this is Quinn Ewers' team and Sark 
has been very loyal and committed to Quinn throughout this time. Adam, always enjoy talking with you, and uh, hopefully get to see you in person here pretty soon and catch up. That'd be great. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate you. The great Adam Rittenberg, ESPN.com. Half Hour brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia, Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf and online at sunburymotors.com. Here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Party time, game time, or just fun time. Doesn't matter what time it is because it's Brewers Outlet time. The Beverage Supermarket has the area's largest beer selection, imports, microbrews, ciders, and domestics. Pick from over 100 ice cold 12 packs and dozens of 24 ounce singles. Soda, snacks, hot sauces, fresh roasted peanuts. Make it one stop party shopping and don't forget the pickle bar. So, whatever you're celebrating or just doing it up, Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, Sunbury wants to see you and thank you for your years of patronage. Hi, this is Season. For over 100 years, the Purdy Insurance Agency has been protecting families and businesses of the greater Susquehanna Valley and beyond. With the experience of our trained and knowledgeable staff, you can rest assured that your needs will be evaluated and met by some of the industry's best representatives. No matter what your insurance needs are, call Purdy Insurance today at 570-286-5855. Visit our website at purdyinsurance.com or check us out on Facebook to see what we can do for you. 